Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are talking about a wonderful new book called Practical Radicals, Seven Strategies to Change the World by Deepak Bhargava and Stephanie Luce. Uh, and Stephanie Luce joins us on Talk World Radio. Welcome, Stephanie. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for all the work you've been doing for many years. Thanks for writing this book uh, together with Deepak. Um, I hope we can give some notion maybe of each of the seven strategies that come up in this book and how they they fit together. Um, you you start off with some discussion of, of underdogs and, and who they are and why they need lots of creative strategies in combination uh, with lots of envisioning and planning. Uh, so, so who are underdogs and why do they need these things? Yeah, it's a great question. We wrestled a bit with the terminology in this book of using the terms underdog and overdog. We our whole approach to the book is to make it generalizable for people in different types of struggles. And so we wanted to think of underdogs as the people who are kind of fighting the status quo, who are generally uh, suffering under one or more systems of oppression, whether it be uh, systemic racism, uh, patriarchy, um, in inequal, unequal relationships in the workplace. Um, and so the context really depends on who the underdog is, but it's it's aimed for those people trying to fight for more economic, racial, you know, climate justice in the world. And then the overdogs, we use that term because we didn't want to necessarily say enemy because enemies uh, might not, it might not always be obvious who's the enemy. And also part of the strategy might depend on winning over some of those uh, overdogs to your sides. So we don't want to think them, of them as permanent enemies, but rather, uh, part of a coalition that might be able to be one to your side. <laughs> uh, yes, absolutely agree. Uh, sometimes there are campaigns uh, where part of the strategy seems to be to to demonize particular overdogs. Uh, so it's a tricky balance there. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah, and it depends. I think what we're arguing too is to really look at the context. There's not one right answer that works in every case, but to understand who are the forces in the coalition keeping the status quo. Some of them may, in fact, be the ones worth demonizing, but not necessarily all of them. Yeah, or demonizing their policies, but not their permanent uh, person. Right. Um, the uh, the, the first of the seven strategies that you discuss in the book uh, is is base building, uh, which uh, in part is about community organizing, which is what I used to be involved with back in the days with ACORN when I benefited frequently from the work of yourself and and Deepak. Um, can you, but but I think every sort of of movement needs base building, right? Yeah, yeah, and this is what we consider the kind of foundational strategy, uh, and it's usually built on what we call solidarity power, and this is really, you know, when we have nothing else, when we have no other forms of power, like political uh, power or economic power, we still have the power to work together, and usually underdogs, that's what they have is their strength in numbers. So base building is really about making change by sticking together with our coworkers, our neighbors, um, other, you know, people in our neighborhood, in our church. And uh, that is when we come together and build these organizations that can make change uh, over the long run. But it's, you know, often slow and and member by member, door by door, coworker by coworker, whether you're forming a union or community organization. Um, but we think that's kind of the foundation to any kind of social change. There's a, there's a criticism I used to, to hear when doing community organizing that, and this is a, a later strategy we'll get to called narrative shift, that we ought to be building media outlets and reaching people in huge numbers through airwaves rather than knocking on door after door, which is just an incredibly over laborious a waste of time because the people are all going to obey what their televisions tell them, no matter what you tell them at their door. How do you, how do you respond? Yeah, I think that's why we we you know we both Deepak and I come out of a, a experiences where we felt that 
these strategies were pitted against one another, that one was superior to the other. And we think that really they have to happen holistically. They're kind of part of a movement ecosystem. And there are people out there that are working on narrative change, working on trying to think about the media and how we make sense of the world. A lot of that can be built into the base building. What you're doing when you're knocking on doors or talking to coworkers is helping them make sense of the world, make sense of our history, think about the future. But it is also necessary for us to think about larger systems of reaching a lot more people, whether it's through radio programs such as yours or uh, through writing books, um, to help people shape, uh, you know, who is the we? Who are we talking about? Who's the, uh, the 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 agent of change? And what is the world we're trying to build? When I when I think of recent movements like Occupy, which comes up in the book, or Black Lives Matter. Uh, they they aren't uh, public relations firms or op-ed writers, but they're nonviolent activist movements that succeed by somehow getting something into corporate media outlets, right? Right. Yeah. And we um, we raised Occupy Wall Street. Actually, I was there. A lot. I live in New York. I was very uh, engaged in Occupy and then wrote about it later. Um, you know, in some ways it was seen as this huge uh you know, it was a big protest. We argue that it actually didn't shut things down. It didn't stop Wall Street from functioning. So it didn't have power in that way. What it did have was more of this uh, power to shape the narrative, to shift people's ideas of blaming, you know, small own homeowners or public sector unions for the economic crisis and really shift the responsibility to that to the 1%. And so that's what uh, Occupy Wall Street really was successful in terms of changing that narrative. And I think what we really want to emphasize is it's not just about, like you say, it's not just a PR firm or doing a focus group of what messages sell. It has to be really listening to people and really the deep organizing to hear people's experiences and how they're making sense and help them reframe that in a way that's based on reality, not just on foisting some slogan on them. Yeah, I was very interested. It, there's a third uh, strategy that we've sort of touched on that I skipped over called disruptive movements. Uh, and I was very interested in discussing your assertion there that that these are are moments that come in history and you can't summon them into being. And I know, as you discuss in the book, that people did similar things to what star started the Occupy movement many times without the mayor or the police being so stupid and the media being so present and having all the stars aligned so that the abuse of the people created a national news story. Uh, but if they hadn't been trying yet again, uh, then it wouldn't have been created either. So how do you how do you explain this notion that you can't summon such a moment into being? Yeah, it's this uh, idea of, um... Upsurge, some people talk about it in the labor movement of moments of upsurge. It's like we're doing the base building work, we're doing the narrative work, um, and we're having protests on a regular basis, like as underdogs. And so it's hard to predict when those really ignite into these larger disruptive movements. We don't have tons of those in history, but they are uh, impactful. I think the lessons we're trying to draw here is one is disruption really has to have the power to wound, as some people say, to really force the overdogs to want to make concessions, come to the table and negotiate. Um, and so we distinguish that from just symbolic protests, which could have their own power in terms of, of shifting the narrative. Um, but the other thing is to, to know that these disruptions, they may look as if they came out of nowhere, but it, it's almost impossible to find an example of a, of a disruptive moment that was truly spontaneous. They're all really building off the backs of, of base building organizations and other kinds of work that really try and try and try, as you say, and then at some point they will uh, erupt. The There's hardly a day goes by now without a parliament or a Congress uh, being disrupted by people who want peace in Gaza. Uh, at, at what moment has it has it erupted? Uh, is at what moment does it become a a disruptive movement? Yeah, I mean that's a great question because that is an example where it seems it just isn't yet 
getting that momentum. Like people are disrupting and creating small inconveniences, but it hasn't yet really stopped the system from functioning. And I, you know, I don't know the answer myself. I wish I did to say what is going to take it over the line to really disrupt and create a concession. Uh, perhaps it's building towards that, but um, this is an example where we have not yet had the power to really bring those those who maintain the status quo to the table to negotiate. So maybe read this book and look for ideas and inspirations, or what would you what would you advise people? Uh, by the way, we're speaking with Stephanie Luce, and the book is Practical Radicals: Seven Strategies to Change the World. Uh, what would you? What would you tell people? I mean, there's so many examples in this book, but as with most progressive movements, the peace movement doesn't come up. It's right. not there. What What would you tell people in the peace movement who nonetheless want to learn from all the, all the examples of all these other movements? Yeah, that's a great question. And we did not include the peace movement. It's, uh, yeah, we were, we were, we wrote such a long book and we left so many other movements out that we would have loved to include. Sure. Um, I think really part of our um, argument here is first is that we often are stuck thinking about um, things in terms of our own uh, silos. And we're trying to make the argument of thinking of it a bit more holistically, of thinking about how different pieces come together and how, again, to break apart the ruling coalition. So thinking about who are those people who are on, on, um, on the other side at this point, but may, in fact, there may be a wedge issue to break them off and make them understand or align, have their interests align with our side. Um, another piece of advice that we have is really training more people in long-term strategy, bringing more people into the room to have more creative minds involved, particularly those most impacted by the issue at hand. Um, in this case, it feels challenging because we feel like we're in a real sense of urgency, like we need to decide things now. And uh, that's a challenge, but always bringing in more minds into trying to solve a problem. They can bring a fresh perspective. They may be able to see it from an angle that we haven't considered. If we're doing the same thing over and over and it isn't working, are there other people we can bring in who will have a different um, idea about uh, a, a possible weak point or a, a point uh, to negotiate? Which, which brings us to uh, the fourth of the seven strategies I'll mention, which is electoral change, which of course I wonder about the need to even mention since people are generally informed that they can either vote or do nothing. These are your options in life. And you know it's, it's overestimated if anything, but it is, uh, it is useful in its place, right? Yeah, well, we do find that you know a lot of uh, our students uh, are very skeptical of electoral work in general. Uh, people think it will never make any difference and not make any change. And we make the argument that, in fact, we cannot ignore it, that just the fact that the overdogs invest so much time and energy in trying to restrict our vote and take it away is a good indicator of just how important it is. So, however, there are more or less strategic ways to engage in electoral change. Um, the traditional model has not been very effective. It's it's often the mainstream parties are just about uh, transactional politics, trying to people just to come out and vote and then forget about them for the rest of the year. We highlight a couple of examples of organizations that are really working to deepen the ele electoral work, to uh, think about it also as base building and think about it also about trying to help enact or implement policies. Uh, so electoral change isn't just about who you pull the lever for on one day a year. It's a, a year round process. And it's about really trying to move towards the power to govern and to do that uh, in a smart way. Yeah. Um, what about the next one, which is very related inside outside uh, activities? Right. So that is related because the idea here uh, that we're talking about inside outside campaigns is when you have at least a few elected officials that are uh, allies or sympathetic, it opens up the possibility to work with them to pass major policy reforms, whether it's healthcare reforms, minimum wage, uh, anti-fracking, these kinds of policies that can have a really major impact on people's lives. But what they require is 
a real alliance between the elected officials who themselves have to organize in in their legislatures. They're organizing their colleagues to vote in favor of the policy. And then on the outside, uh, unions, community organizations, coalitions are engaging in their own base building and protest. They need to be able to hold the politicians accountable uh, in the sense of saying, you know, we uh, demand these policies and we can make change that way. It's uh, obviously necessary and and smart, but easily corrupted. I think. I, I think of you know labor unions asking the Speaker of the House, "What should we tell people to hold rallies for and demand?" And they just become props in theater, and you can't show up with a sign that you want single payer health care because what they want us to want is the uh, public option, and you'll be banned unless your sign says. Public, I mean, this is inside strategy, and they are out of doors. But is it an outside strategy? Right. It's a great point because this uh, it sounds like a great strategy, but it's very uh, tricky to walk the the line between the inside power and the outside power. A lot of it does end up in being corrupted, just as you say, um, and it often can work in one direction where the legislators are really calling the shots and setting up the nature of the compromise, or sometimes um, the large uh, players within the coalition. And like you say, it's often unions might be in a coalition for a policy and then cut a deal that benefits just them and hurts the smaller partners in the coalition. So what we try and write about is the tricky politics of keeping that coalition together, how to think about when to make compromise, and how to think about it in a long-term way where you're looking to pass policies in a way that builds your capacity to pass something stronger the next time around. And so it that means thinking also about how you um, build relationships during the campaign, and then what are the you know the practices and policies of enacting that law. Yeah. Um, the the sixth strategy is momentum, uh, which uh, seems like uh, a, a pretty important one because people will try one thing and see what happens and go home. And you actually need uh, to figure out a series of steps that build momentum, right? Yes, exactly. And this is the one strategy I think that maybe is the least familiar to perhaps a lot of our readers, because really the while the idea itself is old, but the, the term momentum is relatively new. And the idea here is how do we take the best of the base building work that's about um, bringing in new people, bringing in lots of people, volunteers, uh, people who want to engage, but also combining it with this kind of upsurge momentum to really spread a campaign quickly and change the narrative and make something possible that what hadn't been possible before. We highlight examples such as the marriage equality uh, movement, um, some environmental justice, the work of 350.org to really change um, how uh, investments are done around climate change. And uh, also the Bernie Sanders campaign is another way to think about the momentum model. It's bringing in lots of people quickly around an idea that can really go after the what we call the fundamental pillars that uphold um, the status quo. So for the marriage equality movement, for example, things seem like they would never change at all. And then suddenly it, within a few years, it changed quite quickly. I want to give a, a shout out and thank you to 350.org, which has just started telling people to move the money from the wars to climate protection, which some people who have proposed wars have wanted 350.org to do for years. Yeah. So there are there are movements to move the movements as well. Yeah. Um, and that's it's wonderful to see um, the the. The last strategy uh, in the list is uh, collective care, which I think may be a surprising one to many, maybe not students of Gandhi, but or maybe not occupy occupiers, but to a lot of people, it'll be surprising, I think. Yes, I think so. And we've gotten that same reaction in a lot of places. This strategy actually came from one of our students. The book itself comes out of a class that we teach. And all of these concepts were ones we've used with students over the years and got feedback. And a student you know, said that they thought this was missing from the list, um, particularly thinking about it historically and in other countries. A lot of uh, places where people have really nothing else, no other form of power, this is one that they start with because it's necessary for survival. 
Um, the question is, is it strategic? And we would say not always, right? Sometimes it is just a survival strategy, but we argue that it can be strategic and in fact has been because it can do a number of things. It can enable people to stick with a campaign or a movement for the long term. It gives people uh, the confidence to take risks or it you know, can say like, okay, someone has my back. I'm willing to go on strike because I know there'll be a strike fund or I, I know someone will think about childcare. Um, and so it actually can increase our capacity to take on these risks and engage in the other kinds of movement building that we need to do. Um, so it takes some work to think about, you know, mutual aid is a great model for helping people get through a pandemic or so forth. But we have to also then, you know, think about it. How do we make it strategic? So collective care is a strategy in addition to being a survival mechanism. Makes sense to me. Um, one thing I wanted to ask about that makes less sense to me, um, when I when I go and talk to good young rebel students who want to change the world and I talk about abolishing war, they don't think about the, pen some of them don't think about the Pentagon budget. You know, they think about the glory of the Haitian revolution. Is, is, is your life devoted to telling the Haitians not as if I have a time machine and I'm dedicated to enslaving Haitians? And, and, and so I wonder about the wisdom of including the violent Haitian revolution in a book of nonviolent examples of good nonviolent activist campaigns. What, what's the relevance to today? Like where on earth right now would it be smart for someone to imitate the Haitian Revolution? Uh, good question. We uh, thought a bit about this because we, you know, we don't uh, think that that make that strategy really makes sense today in today's context. Um, certainly not in the United States. That's for we sure. We agree. <laughs> yeah. So um, arguing that putting that in the book felt necessary because we were telling the story of the end of uh, slavery and the fight to abolish slavery. And so it felt like a crucial piece of the history to include. However, we do make the case that slavery was ended in many parts of the world without war. Even, uh, you know, and even if people say, well, what about the Civil War? That's true, but it was ended in much of the U.S. North and Northern states without war, right? It was ended through legislative strategies or other forms of disruption. So war is not necessary, uh, violence is not necessary to end a system of oppression. Uh, it is part of the history and it felt wrong to leave it out because it is in that story. But um, we also do mention military power in the book because even if we are committed to a non-military strategy of our own, we know historically the overdogs use this time and again, whether it's through an actual military or through the police or through border um, enforcement, we need to know what they might do. We need to know how to defend ourselves or protect ourselves or anticipate to understand when police might be infiltrating our movements um, when the National Guard may be used against us. So uh, we highlight military power in the sense that it is still highly relevant in our struggles, even if we aren't using it as a strategy. Yeah, and and there's some excellent points about ending slavery in the North, and even in Washington D.C., it was ended with money, not with war. Uh, and the 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 ubiquitous argument that it would have been too much money uh, mm -hmm. is a little strange because they spent over twice the amount on the war that was the market value for buying human beings. Um, so uh, not, of course, that there was any uh, interest uh, in the South in, in ending slavery that way. Um, I, I, I wonder, uh, I mean, there's lots of great new examples and, and wisdom and strategy and synthesis in, in this book, uh, Practical Radicals, Seven Strategies to Change the World. But just the basic idea of needing to sit down and envision and make a plan and strategize what you're going to do is just so often ignored and, and not done. People will jump into activism and not do it. And it's it's bewildering to me. Why? Why do we need to tell people, uh, have you given any thought to whether this will work or not? <laughs> you know? Right. And that's really, I think, the main uh, motivation we had for the book is kind of seeing this. Our classes are uh, mid-career organizers, people who have been in the field for 10 or 15 years, but never really got this kind of skill training. Um, and it, there's a lot of reasons for that. But I think, you know, the 
the conservative movement does it pretty well. They have schools that train people in long-term strategy and they take it quite seriously. Our side has either because we're always on the defensive or because we're just eager to jump into action. We don't feel we have the time. We just don't set us at the time to train ourselves in these skills. What we're trying to do is get people to think, what is the world we're trying to build looking 10, 20, 30 years out? And then what are some steps that we need to do to get there? What, what's a realistic assessment of our power in the moment? And what kinds of power do we need to build to make those bigger wins possible? And so it's about democratizing the strategy work. It's about making it a regular practice. You know, we point out that you know, corporations have full-time staff that do scenario planning and think about what would, what would, what are we going to do in the next climate crisis? So these are the things our organizations could be doing, spending one day a week scenario planning, one day a week building alliances with new partners, uh, doing this long-term strategy work that uh, we've ignored for too long. Very good. We've got just a couple of minutes left. Stephanie Luce, where can people get the book? Where can they follow you and your work? And keep in touch? Uh, well, the easiest is just to, we have a website called practicalradicals.org, and that would be a place where you can get the book as well as a discussion guide that we've made to help your group work through uh, the not only the chapters, but we offer 37 tools, worksheets for groups to use to apply the concepts. And we've, uh, we have a podcast as well, which is a limited uh, number of episodes, but they're interviews with organizers from the book. And people could perhaps use that discussion guide to help uh, in, in courses teaching this book as well. Exactly. And again, that's it, since this comes out of teaching, um, we really are eager for people to share it in their classes. So if people want to you know, look at syllabi and things like that, they should definitely reach out to us through our website. Wonderful. The book is called Practical Radicals, Seven Strategies to Change the World by Deepak Bhargava and Stephanie Luce. We've been speaking with Stephanie Luce. Stephanie, thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Thanks so much. It's been a real pleasure. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.